Hi, Hi, Paulette. There we go. Awesome. So uh, my name is Paulette Epstein. I uh, work at the Michigan Science Center. I am the education and theaters manager there. Um, and so <coughs> today we are going to be talking a little bit about how to make uh, STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics attainable for everyone. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about accessibility. Um, and in our ever-expanding te uh, ever technological world, uh, we have a large demand for STEM jobs. Being in Detroit, uh, I see that a lot um, because we have motor companies coming to us and saying we need people that are qualified to work in our field, uh, in, in the motor uh, and car industry. And so there is this sort of surge of jobs that are out there and they don't have qualified candidates to fill them. Um, so to meet the demand uh, and keep up with the rest of the world as well, uh, we need to reach out to communities that are underrepresented um, in the field. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to engage different types of communities and some of the challenges we face to diversify uh, STEM fields. So uh, go ahead, and Anna, talk a little bit about yourself and your institution. Well, let's introduce Anna, too. Hi. I'm, I'm Anna, or Anna, or hey, you, conference host lady. Um, <laughs> I, I answer to all. Um, I am the manager of the James S. McDonald Planetarium at the St. Louis Science Center. And um, I actually, when I was still a volunteer there, I first got my jump into accessibility when I created a, uh, an accessible version of the little star that could for our visitors who are blind. And then we discovered that it actually worked really well for our visitors who have autism and Down syndrome too. And it kind of just went from there and I've been branching out now into reaching out to people who um, getting getting kids in who speak foreign languages um, and uh, just working with uh, within the community on things like that. Uh, we have a really diverse population here in St. Louis. Um, we also have a lot of tech industry. Boeing Defense is based here, um, and so it's it's cool because we get a lot of volunteers that come in from Boeing that we we get to work with too. So we have some really great examples that work with us at the Science Center. Um, and we've been trying to branch out too in terms of having accessibility days um, and we're working on building up that program as well. And this is Steve from Sundays in the Office with Steve. <laughs> yes, uh, my name is Steve Berklin. I'm from the Adler Planetarium. I'm a theater technician there. And I also am in Sundays in the Office with Steve, which is a silly little thing that probably only some of you know about. Uh, anyway, uh, the Adler, we uh, also have, we're, we're branching into accessibility, uh, the idea of accessibility now. Uh, I was introduced to it only recently, about two or three years ago, uh, and I've been there for quite a long time. But uh, the, I was tasked with, with designing a captioning system, which some of you may have seen, uh, Adler Caps. We, uh, we have a little vendor table out there. And, uh, and I'll be doing a talk for it on Thursday, or tomorrow. But uh, it's essentially captioning, and, and I really started to get into what the needs were for that and bringing in focus groups for it. So uh, we're trying to open up in that area as well. Yeah, and uh, so I'm, I'm in Detroit, um, and we have one of, the, one of the most diverse cities, I've, I think, in the country. Um, we have a very large African-American population. Uh, we actually have the largest uh, population of, um, from Arabia and the, Air, the uh, Arab region. Um, it's the largest one outside of that region, outside of the Middle East, uh, in the Detroit area. We have a very large Hasidic Jewish population. We have a very large uh, uh, Hispanic population. And so we're sort of a melting pot of uh, places. So it's uh, a very interesting place to, to be able to, to teach and to, to reach out to our community. Um, so we're just going to kind of chat a little bit. If you guys have questions, interrupt. I want to make this like as uh, interactive as possible uh, because no one wants to sit and listen to, t to us talk for an hour. Um, and uh, so uh, the, first, the first question that I kind of thought, thought about when I was trying to make this, uh, this panel and the questions was, you know, why, why is this so important? Why is reaching out to people in our community so important, the underrepresented um, folks. So, um, first of all, I mean, if you're not reaching out to new people, how are you ever going to find new ideas or get the, st the, the, the quality staffing that you, you need? Um, 
one of the areas that I'm very passionate about, and I know Paulette is too, is uh, reaching out to young women. Um, and I, I think that's just a natural fit for both of us. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, Paulette uh, has the STEMinista program. I've joined that too, and that's something we're trying to reach out to. And not necessarily catering only to girls, particularly between the grades of like four through eight. That's where we seem to lose them, especially those middle school years. Um, but also showing the boys that STEM is for women too. Um, and, and part of how we can do that is by having a diverse staff, as diverse as you can get. Um, and that's something that we always strive for. So showing, showing girls that women hold these roles. Um, showing one of the biggest things is uh, one of our volunteers, uh, you may see her around this week, Brittany. She is a, um, she's one of our volunteers from Boeing. Um, and she's worked on all different things there. She's an engineer. She does our star shows on the weekends. Um, she's African American, and it's awesome because I see these little girls looking up to her, and they're the little girls who come from um, some of our socioeconomically depressed areas, and they see her, and they see everything that she's achieved, and she's actually from the Detroit area too, so we have a tie there too. But um, and and they think, wow, I can do this, um, and we're starting to see more of that in mainstream with things like hidden figures, but we need to support those things and push them. And, and it's really cool to watch these girls who think that, oh no, I can't do math, that's a boys thing, or I just, I'm not good at it because I'm a girl. I can't, I can't tell you how much it breaks my heart. It's 2017 and I'm still hearing that. So um, having those people who can act as a mentor, mentors are important to us as we grow in our careers. It's important to kids as they grow up um, and having those people to see. Yeah, I, I definitely think mentors are a very big part of that, of the, the question of diversity. I also think there's, there's two, I guess, two aspects we have to consider with that. You can, uh, there's part of it is diversity in programming, which is what you're talking about with, like in this case, uh, women in science. But that can be as, as complex as that or as simple as adding, adding a new element to an existing program to activate a different learning style, for example. Like very simple thing like that is a way of increasing diversity and improving diversity. But the other, I think the other side of that coin is that having more diverse programs and, and engaging with more groups allows your museum to be more visible. Like it just simply increases visibility of your, of your museum. Uh, we try to, I mean at the other we try to do as, as many groups as we can and sometimes they just don't bite. You know, sometimes they don't. But uh, the ones that do, it's, it really brings in a lot more visitors to the museum. And, and not just to the museum, we want to, you know, we want to make sure that our community has, has a chance to grow. Um, so I'm in Detroit, and it's a very impoverished area. Um, and a lot of the kids that are in the area have never seen the nighttime sky, ever. <laughs> so we try and get as many people into our museum as possible that, that haven't had the opportunity to be inspired um, and try and give them a little bit of a leg up and sort of an equal leg up. Um, in that, and actually, uh, so the, the Science Center uh, offers a Sponsors of Science program, um, which we, we really love. Uh, it, it allows us to bring in school groups. We pay for their transportation, we pay for their field trip, um, and we, we give them uh, sometimes special programming. Uh, the uh, Michigan standardized test is called the MSTEP, and uh, the Detroit area uh, did not test very well um, the first year that they did the MSTEP because they changed over from, from one test to another and they, they just don't test it well in general. Um, and so this past year we brought in every single fourth grader and every single seventh grader in the Detroit Public School Community District. We brought them into the Science Center and did special programming specifically for what they're learning in the classroom. Um, so what they're learning in the classroom may not necessarily click. Um, while they're learning it. Uh, but I actually, one of my staff members is a teacher. Uh, that's her day job. And then she, she works for me on the weekends and evenings. Uh, and she brought her students, because she teaches in the Detroit uh, public schools, and she brought the kids in. And she had one child who is on the autism spectrum. Um, and he wasn't getting it in the classroom. And he actually like told her, oh, this is what you were trying to teach us. I get it now. And so just sort of being able to give a different perspective um, on what they're learning in the classroom and trying to reinforce 
what they're learning maybe in a different way uh, it makes it click a little bit with those kids and and we're really lucky to have you know the big three uh, motor companies in, in Detroit that we can reach out to so for um, uh, Chrysler and GM fund a lot of this stuff, a lot of the Detroit Public Schools coming to us. But we have whole grade, grade level initiatives and we're looking to expand. Let's see, uh, we went to every third grade classroom, every fourth grade classroom, brought every fourth grade classroom in and seventh. This year we're looking to expand to sixth and eighth, bringing them to the Science Center. And uh, another great option if you're looking for funding um, to help bring kids in is if you if you have a NASA Space Grant Consortium. Um, they used to fund buses for us quite frequently um, to bring in kids from the school districts who just, the buses were literally the only thing preventing them from coming in. Um, and uh, NASA has a lot of great opportunities with grants. They love reaching out. They love the diver diversity aspect. Um, in particular, if you can show, um, we were awarded uh, a little over $800,000 to do a Mars exhibit uh, a couple years ago. We're still finishing that up, um, but part of that grant was that we needed to design um, several different programs and they needed to focus on um, the diverse and uh, less uh, economically stable areas of St. Louis and bringing those kids in, uh, particularly between uh, grades four and eight. Um, in that middle school range and working with them and getting them excited, uh, especially about engineering, but all of those STEM areas. Uh, Anna, you were talking about uh, busing just now and it, it made me think about something. We, we were trying to invite a group in from, I, it, was, it was some underserved area of school. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the idea was we were giving them free tickets to see a, a show, a particular show. And everyone loved it, it's like, ah, oh, they're getting free tickets, this is great. And it got to, it, the, the process wasn't fully thought out because it got to a point where uh, the question was uh, what will happen when they arrive and the people at the museum wanted them to arrive all together and uh, buy a charter bus, like rent a charter bus. And it's like, okay, well, they would not normally have come to the museum if we didn't give them free tickets and now we're giving them free tickets and making them buy a charter bus. So the, the, the lesson we learned was that in dealing with diversity and making sure that we can bring in these groups, you have to think through the whole process and not just like, here's a free thing and now an expenditure, or now something that is like, yeah, against the whole process of the, that you're trying to deal with. We ran into the exact same issue. The first year that we did our grade level initiatives for um, the, the MSTEP program, uh, we, we were like, okay, come in, have your free, free field trip here at the Science Center, and we only had like a third participate, because they couldn't afford the busing to get there, or they couldn't get the buses. So uh, the second year that we did it, we worked with the, the school district um, to have them bring the, to do the buses. We'll pay for them. You guys make sure that, that you coordinate the buses. That also didn't yeah. work. Um, so if any of you guys have heard a little bit about the Detroit Public Schools, they are no longer the Detroit Public Schools. They're the Detroit Public School Community District for a reason. Uh, they went through a rebranding process because uh, they have a lot of a lot of issues going on. Um, so it's it's uh, really awesome for us to be in a community like that and to be able to reach out to um, those kids because they're really really not getting um, a lot of the things that they need from from the classroom experience. They they can't really do anything outside of what they have to do and what they're what they're learning. So there's not a lot of like inspiration, I guess, and part of, part of the great thing about coming to a science center or planetarium or anything is, yes, the content is there, and the content should be there, you need to follow the standards, but it's shown in a different way, and it's, uh, to me, a little more inspiring, um, and it's fun. Love it, it's fun. It's if they active. have, it's active, if they have a good time, they're gonna remember things a lot better. It's an environment that's different from the classroom where maybe they're struggling or they're not inspired and by pulling them out, I mean like, how many times have you been staring at something so long and you're like, I just can't do this and you walk away from it and the second you walk out of that room, you solve the problem or, or something clicks or something. It's, it's that same trigger for, for getting them out of that classroom where maybe they feel stressed about learning. I've had kids come up to me um, and tell me, I hated science until we talked to you. 
and I didn't mm -hmm. know science didn't have to be difficult. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you decide which to encourage, which to best do? I mean, with the, not a lot of ethnic diversity in the part of the state I'm in, actually, but there is a lot of economic diversity, a lot of very poor, poor rural areas. Um, but, I mean, so some of them would have these challenges. Is it perhaps better to work with the buses or perhaps better to go to them with an inflatable? Do you, do you have an opinion? Um, so, so uh, for the people who are streaming right now, uh, he is asking about uh, whether it's better to go to the school with a portable or have them come to the science center. And I think it kind of boils down to, because we also have a portable and we've got the planetarium, um, we have an outreach program that goes out to the schools all the time. Um, and I, I think as trying to get as many touch points as possible is ideal, um, though the funding might not necessarily be there to be able to go out and bring them in, um, because we've actually done that. We've gone out to the, that's what we did with fourth grade last year. We went out to the classrooms, did an activity with them, then brought them to the Science Center um, and sort of finished out their lesson at the Science Center. Um, but I think it kind of boils down to whatever is easiest for you and for the school district. I, yeah, actually, we, we don't have a portable option at this moment uh, at the Adler. But uh, to, to expand sort of on what Paulette was saying, the, I think that the important thing is to actually go out and outreach with them first to uh, assess need, I guess is a, is a kind of a way to say it. Uh, and I mean, we, we sometimes will de develop a project or a program and invite groups in. Uh, and that, that does have a draw and everything like that. But it was only when I was starting to do outreach outside the museum when I started seeing like really what, what was needed. Uh, in one particular case, we were doing um, outreach to Southern Illinois just before the eclipse, and uh, one of the we were doing a high school group, I think it was, and doing telescopes, just the solar observing, and these were like a sophomore level group, this particular uh, class, and maybe five or six students in that class said that they had never seen looked through a telescope before, which was just astounding to me that they made it through high school like to that level and have not done telescope work. Uh, so yeah, so I would say. In your particular case, I'd actually recommend just going out with a set of telescopes first and assessing like, what, what, you, what was best. Yeah. Um, and also really working with, community, or with, with your school districts yeah. um, in general. Uh, I, I really encourage those partnerships. So like I said, at the Science Center, we work really, really, really closely with um, the Detroit Public Schools. But um, we, we also work with the suburban uh, school districts as well. There's a, there's a school out in Southfield that we're uh, working on making an outreach program for uh, where we're, we're basically building an after school program. Anyone in here familiar with the Young Astronauts program from the Reagan era? Um, so they were still teaching it at that school um, and we're kind of taking over the program, enhancing and, and uh, so we, we work really closely with all school districts around and, and those partnerships are really, really important when you're trying to, to get to the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Schools to do outreach there. Who is the person you tend to approach at the school? So, so who do you approach at the school? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I personally, I tend to approach the teachers, the actual teachers themselves. Uh, there's pantomiming going on. Sorry. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I do the teachers themselves because uh, they're the ones who have the students that that are you're going to be interacting with. Uh, however, at some point you're going to have to deal with the administrators to like organize the funding and everything like that. But m particularly, I start with the schools, the teachers themselves. Yeah. Um, so recently, one of the things that I did was um, I actually reached out to. We have a, a French immersion school in St. Louis, um, and so I I actually have my undergraduate degree. I was a French major, and I have a license to teach French that I don't use. So I um, actually got to use it. I, so I reached out and I actually, I had no clue what I was doing when I reached out. So I just contacted the principal and uh, we played phone tag for a while and I got back, she got back to me and um, she said, yeah, we'd love to do it. We just, we don't have the funding. Um, and then a little bit after that, one of the first grade teachers came back and reached out to me and we worked something out and we were able to bring them in. And um, it actually opened up a lot, and so now the entire school wants to try and raise the funding to, to come in and work with us. 
Um, and it's actually, we're trying to branch out too to like high schools to get their French classes to come in um, and maybe team up with their, their science um, teachers. And so um, French is not a predominantly spoken language here in St. Louis. Um, we have a large Bosnian population too. Um, but I just so happen to speak French, so we're going with what we have. So some of it's just using your resources. Um, but that, um, that enables us to reach um, a different group that maybe we wouldn't normally reach. And we're also reaching the, the, the racially and um, economically diverse populations within those schools to that way. But that was just a me taking a shot in the dark reaching out to the principal because I was like, hey, this sounds like fun, let's do it. Yeah. So when when we work with uh, the, the schools in the suburbs, generally we reach out to the teachers first and then go through the principals sort of after the fact. Um, but with the, the uh, with DPS, they have, since it is such a large district, they, they have an office of science um, that we work very, very closely with. So there's upsides to working with the teachers first and there's upsides to working with the, the uh, upsides and downsides to working with the, the district first. Um, so with the teachers first, you, you hear firsthand what they, what they want to, um, and what programming they want. Um, and the, the only problem is like you may work on a program with them and then the principal says no. Or the district says no. That has happened to us in the past. Um, and sort of the, the upside to working with the district is okay, every, the district is on board, awesome. Uh, the downside to that is that information isn't necessarily communicated to the teachers, um, and that's where things get a little tricky, because I, I, I know we did end up going to a couple of classrooms, uh, and we showed up, and they went, oh, you're here today, awesome. Yeah, so it's kind of, um, if, if you're working with a smaller school district, I'd, I'd recommend trying to like work with everybody. Uh, bigger school districts, it's a lot harder. Um, to do. We have a, a pretty large institution too at the St. Louis Science Center. We have uh, a little over 200 people on staff. Um, and so as manager of the planetarium, I amongst the, some of the other areas like our early childhood area and, and some of the other galleries, we answered to the director of education. Um, and so a lot of times she's also the one that's reaching out. So I might go and tell my boss that I have this idea, but I don't know who to reach out to. And so at least in my situation, it's a lot of working within my own institution to get those proper channels because maybe I don't have the right channel to reach out to somebody, but I can guarantee you that either my counterpart who's in public programs does, and she can help me reach out, or my boss does, or um, we actually have just joined with um, Carnegie um, with their STEM Pathways program, we have our STEMosphere program that we're just launching, and that actually is taking a few different districts, and we're working with their teachers to increase their STEM literacy so that they are comfortable working in the classroom with their own kids. And so some of, some of it, too, is not just working with the kids themselves, but getting their teachers feeling comfortable yeah. working with the kids. Yeah, we run a, we run a professional development session uh, about once a month. Uh, it's, and we, we try and focus specifically on uh, how to teach uh, engineering design. Uh, we, we also you know, let them know what resources we have, what programs we have, and all of that stuff. But we're finding with NGSS and the sort of changeover to NGSS, the teachers are most confused about how to teach engineering design. Um, so we do run professional development sessions uh, for the teachers to come in and, and learn that stuff. And we have uh, programs where like, they, they subsidize it so that the teachers can come in and learn all that stuff for free. Um, and we you know, don't have to charge the teachers um, to, to further their, their, their learning. So. Yeah. Um, Does anyone else have an outreach? Oh yeah, go ahead. All the way in the back. <laughs> Gonna give him his workout. All right, so I'm Allie, I'm also from the St. Louis Science Center. And I, was just, <laughs> um, I was just wondering, so when working with students or even adults with learning disabilities um, or autism, I know that there's certain ways that you're supposed to work with or different learning styles. Are you aware of any training or workshops that specifically deal with that for educators on the floor working with this, excuse me, working with these people every day? Um, are you aware of any resources to learn how to do that? 
So um, there's, at least within St. Louis, there's a couple of different organizations I've, I've trained with. Um, I took some courses both in undergrad and in grad school for it. Um, but a lot of times you can reach out to local school districts and they'll have a paraprofessional who will work with you at least on the basics for um, especially working with kids who have autism or ADHD um, to help you feel more comfortable and understand how to maybe work with those kids if they're having a meltdown, the best way to, to work with them. Um, I've also worked heavily with Lighthouse for the Blind St. Louis. I've gotten a lot of training and best practices, not only from them, but with the, the TVIs, the Teachers for the Visually Impaired, and their O&Ms, the Orientation and Mobility Teachers. Um, they've, they've done a lot of work with me to help me better understand. And so I found um, even if there isn't an organization that does specific training, if you reach out to the teachers and the school districts, a lot of times they're so thrilled that you want to be more accessible that they're happy to work with you on that. I also know that um, our botanical gardens here in town has done classes as well. So a lot of times different museums, um, you can reach out to them too, and uh, especially if you know they have a program. Um, like I believe it's the Guggenheim has a, a touch program for their art. Um, they have tactile art pieces, and I think they do some trainings too. So depending on where you are, certain museums also sometimes do offer different trainings. Um, and sometimes it takes a little digging, but like I said, school districts are actually a pretty good place to start. Yeah, and like we have, we have resources, um, we have folks that come in and do like training sessions and stuff like that. We actually work with another institution in the area, the Detroit Zoo, and we do our training sessions together. Um, and we, we actually get all of the staff that we can possibly get in the same room um, to, to go through those training sessions because it is very important to, to learn a little bit about you know different methods that could possibly work, um, though there is no magic formula for working with um, special needs. And so you just kind of have to, like, if this isn't working, try something else and keep going. And, and um, there's lots of papers out there that you can read on, on stuff like that as well if you don't have access to uh, someone that can come in and do a training session. But partnering with other organizations um, to get a training session going is really important and to, and, and to train the frontline staff. To train the staff that are going to be dealing with it, or um, and and working with the kids um, is, and adults um, is is really really important. Yeah, we we have not uh, we've been talking about embracing this this idea of, uh, of staff training for for all for pretty much all those groups. We have not done that yet. Uh, we know that there are groups that do it in Chicago. Uh, in fact, the one uh, the one that we were really considering was one for. Um, uh, uh, disabled persons training. I, I don't remember the name of it, but it was essentially a group of people come to the museum and you talk to them, like they have various needs and, and you, you address it. Uh, but what we have done is brought in focus groups from, from teachers uh, and, and uh, uh, yeah, teacher focus groups to come in and assess our, our existing level where we're at, in particular with the closed captioning system. Mm -hmm. We brought in several teachers, like it was like a whole teacher's group and we said, you know, hey, can you use this for us and let us know if it's working? <laughs> Yeah, and it was yeah. awesome, yeah. like really good content from that. Yeah. And we also open up our museum um, on a, a Tuesday every month uh, and a Sunday morning every month um, for folks with special needs. We turn the sounds down, lights up. Uh, we do uh, shows in the IMAX theater um, where we have the lights up just a little bit. Um, and we don't do our, we have this flashy, awful light show in the beginning. I've been trying to get rid of it since I got there. Um, but. <laughs> They, uh, so we do that in the beginning of all of our shows except for the ones that we, we do during our, our special needs times. And um, we're finding that uh, parents are really receptive to that and they're very appreciative of it um, because our science center is intense. You walk in and it kind of looks like 1995 threw up all over the place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it... It also is a very open area, very noisy. There's a lot going on, a lot of flashing lights. Um, and though not everybody has the same sensory sensitivities, um, turning that down a little bit and being able to uh, being able to bring them in, they may, they may not have been able to come in on a different day. So we make special times at the Science Center that we, we do lights up, sounds down um, for, for our special needs guests. 
Um, another thing too, you mentioned when you're you were like prototyping and asking mm -hmm. for teachers are a great resource. Little kids oh. are mm -hmm. another awesome focus group. They are blunt as all get out, Honest. and they will tell you exactly what they think and how to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, so I realize not everything's <laughs> going to be aimed at small children, but um, if you are working with them, definitely definitely include them, not just their teachers. Because they're the ones who, for example, um, when I was doing the Little Star program, that's, that's aimed at younger children. Um, so I talked to their teachers about different things, and they said, oh yeah, this is how they learn it, and this is, you know, this is good, you should change this. But then I actually handed it to children. And they were able to sit there and go, well, I don't know, what is this? What is this supposed to be? I don't know what this is. Why did you make it this way? You should do this. And I changed it, and I brought it back to them, and they said, oh yeah, this is great, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not that eloquent, but the point was there. Yeah. So little, little kids are great. They're great to learn from. If you're doing focus groups, definitely, if it's age appropriate, obviously, definitely include the kids in that yeah. as well. Yeah. And definitely, um, especially when you're, honestly, when you're working with any community, um, even, even the ones that we feel like we're part of, never assume anything. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> never assume learning styles, never assume, uh, you know, you may be dealing with a whole big group of kids and you're trying to be hip. Don't, don't assume. <laughs> I've, I've seen some, uh, some people do some interesting things to try and get the kids <laughs> on board. And I never assume I'm hip. Yeah. <laughs> Ditto. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, like never, never assume, like I, I did a show, um, I developed a, a preschool show uh, that's it's a live show uh, and I I was in the dome and I had a kid in there who was uh, he, he was special needs for sure and I you know I didn't assume anything about him and I did the show as I would normally do it and he kept asking questions and so I answered his questions, I changed the show, and that's the great thing about doing live shows mm -hmm. is you can gauge your audience, um, especially in the planetarium. Uh, but that, that kid, after the show, actually on, asked me what dark matter was. Like, hmm. he was very, very intelligent, and, and his mother thanked me after, because they're like, everyone always assumes he's stupid, but he was a great kid, and, and it was, I was, I was happy that I was able to give them that experience. Yeah. And, oh, I was just going to add to that, like, communicate with them, too. Like, you don't need to ask them what, what they may be dealing with. Just ask them, do you have any questions? How can I help you? Mm -hmm. Like, you would ask anyone else, and they'll tell you what they need. Mm -hmm. Or they'll tell you they don't need anything, and that's fine, too. So my question is that um, at our university at Edinburgh, we have a very large OSD pop um, OSD students population. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of accessibility to our campus and stuff, but most of the people I talk to in the OSD program aren't really in the STEM fields. There are a lot of them in the psych, communication, or even special ed fields, because I talk to them a lot. I actually work with the OSD, I'm a meal aide, and I talk to them and they say that it's not really accessible to them, the STEM fields, and how would you, what's your opinion on like changing that or getting that to be more accessible to people? Or so That's I'm going to have question. to say, working with them to create programming that, are mm -hmm. in because I mean science, science is accessible to everybody, absolutely accessible to everybody, and I am a firm believer of that. And there just might not be stuff out there where they feel like it is accessible to them. So working with them to develop programming that they feel is accessible um, is a is a great way uh, to be able to to offer and make them feel included. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's really nothing to add to that. You really have to work with them. You, you really yeah, have to work with With a new them. group like that, yeah. Yeah. it's just a matter of, of, of inviting them over and seeing what you can develop. Yeah. Yeah, which we've also done. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and uh, with, you know, I, I've also gone out to, to schools in the, the community. So with the Steminista Project, um, fourth through eighth grade girls. We were targeting fourth through eighth grade girls. That's part of the reason why we went to every fourth grade classroom. Um, and we actually brought a role model with. Um, and I'm my, my degree is in physics. I'm an astronomer. Um, and so I went with to like 20 classrooms 
It was a lot. Uh, but they, uh, there were a lot of people, or there were a lot of kids that, that told me that, that STEM isn't accessible to them because they don't have any money. Um, and that's part of the reason why we're, we're really trying to push this because it, it doesn't matter where, what background you come from, it, it should be accessible to everybody. And yeah, I would agree with what you said too about work with them. Mm -hmm. So I'll admit, I, I wouldn't know what, what to do. Yeah, I would have to ask, know. I would have to do research in that area, but I didn't know what I was doing off the bat either when I started working with the kids who were blind. Um, I just saw that we didn't have any braille in the planetarium anywhere, and then I started thinking about, well, how do I even get them to see a show when they can't see it and it's a highly visible medium. And I tried to think of different ways, different tactile ways. Being an educator, you learn about Gardner's seven modes of learning and everything. Mm -hmm. So you start thinking about different ways in, in universal design, but that's when you go actually to them. And I know that Dr. Hurd, who's sitting next to you, has also gone out and done that exact same thing. You go out, you ask them uh, to work alongside you mm -hmm. and help you to figure out how to help them so that you guys can work together to make STEM attainable. For, for the stream meeting, he just said that, that um, it's mostly the college students who are struggling to, to find um, STEM attainable and to, to find the, um, what they need to succeed with that. Um, so I don't know how you, I know um, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, we had an accessibility office. Um, so if you have something like that on campus, I would definitely recommend partnering with them and talking to them too and then reach out to those who maybe have been brave enough to come forward and work with them. So it's, it's not attainable to them right now, but if you brainstorm with them a little bit and say, well, what's worked, with, what's worked for you in the area where you are successful right now? So you said a lot of them go into communications. Maybe have a chat with them openly. Why do you love communications? Why, what makes you passionate about this area? Take those ideas about how, how that works for them and why they're passionate about that area and then see if there's maybe similarities that can be crossed over to STEM because maybe there's just this block that you know you think that STEM has to be a certain way, you know, math has to be numbers on a page, um, but maybe there's another way to view it. And sometimes it just takes more than one brain. I know I get stuck, stuck looking at things and then I'll text Paulette in the middle of the night because I know she's usually awake and I'll ask her a question and she'll be like, oh, well, I mean, I would do it like this. And I'm like, oh, God, I didn't even think about that because I've been stuck on this so long. So the two heads are better than one. Yeah. And, you know, that's the best part about brainstorming. You throw ideas out there and if they're terrible, you throw them away. And if they're great, you run with it. And then maybe down the line you see it's not feasible, but there's a way to tweak it. Mm -hmm. But I would say definitely partner with them. Find out what works for them and see how you can twist it to an area that they think is an attainable so that you can make it attainable. Yeah, can I ask, oh, sorry. I, th I think we had another question. Oh, okay. It's okay, you can go ahead and read. No, you could, okay. Uh, uh, can I ask, oh, sorry, there, go ahead, sorry. Okay. I didn't see you with the mic. <laughs> you can go after me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. First of all, thank you all so much for this. Uh, I was wondering for the, especially for the low sensory times, that kind of thing, how do you communicate to an audience that isn't already coming to your institution that you have that available to them? So in the Detroit area, there's a lot of like groups um, that we reach out to the groups and have them reach out to their contacts. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's really how we drive that, uh, that audience to come to the Science Center. Um, we, we reach out to the schools that, that, we reach out to all the schools and have them, uh, but we also have a few schools that are, are specifically for uh, folks with special needs and the, the sensory sensitive ones. Um, and they, they help us kind of get that word out because they know that, those, that the parents are looking for a way to, to get their kids excited and get them in, interested in, in something. Um, and uh, they, they, I mean, STEM is a, it's a big field. 
and to say that, oh, well, it's, it's just, science is just not for me, math is just not for me, um, that, that takes away a whole big part of uh, the, the entire world around you. So they, um, they're looking to, to be able to have opportunities. Um, so we, we really do reach out. We have a whole, and we also have a list of people that, you know, when they, when they sign up on our website, they, they check a box, like they're interested in hearing about special needs and stuff like that. So we will we'll be able to e-blast them um, when we do have our special programming. Yeah, we, um, I definitely agree with that. Like we had the obvious when I was doing the programs with the, with, uh, the blind. Um, we have the Missouri School for the Blind here in St. Louis. So I was like, well, that's a no brainer. I'm gonna reach out to them. And then I found out about Lighthouse for the Blind and I reached out to them in St. Louis Society for the Blind. And by reaching out to them, I found out that um, St. Louis Public School District and a lot of the school districts that are out in the county, um, they all have their own within their own cities, um, they all have what's called special school district. So special school district serves all public schools within St. Louis city and county. Um, and those teachers go to the different schools that are in their area for their different needs. Um, depending on the day. Sometimes they work with one kid, sometimes they work with several. Um, and so by reaching out to them, I was able to actually um, get word out to more schools than I realized I would be able to. Um, and that was just by, actually I found out about special school district because of Lighthouse. So um, it's amazing how one organization will get you in touch with a lot more. Something I was actually, I was thinking about it in direct response to your question, uh, sir, about the uh, the OSD community that you had in your in your area, uh, but it actually expands pretty much on what the two of you just said. Um, I think there's there's sort of another area we we should consider is that the accessibility uh, providing accessibility is more than just providing the the education part, right? It's also providing them, like in your case, with the opportunity to ultimately go into that field. So uh, consider doing internships programs in your, in your institutions. And it's, it's a big word because the internship is a huge logistical you know, component to your museum. Uh, we have some uh, interns, and, and the, there's an intern coordinator, which is a, a, pay, a, hired, a paid position in our museum. They manage that. But uh, I, think, I think there are two programs. One is called Tech Wednesday, which is just for kids to come after school and uh, do tech-related projects. And then we have a group of teen interns, which uh, we can kind of think of them as like a think tank for the, for the museum. They're posited with a, uh, coming up with a solution to something for the whole summer, and then they just work toward that. Um, um, using the existing departments as mentors if they have questions. Uh, so there is, a, there is a logistical component which definitely has a financial like, a, a hit in your museum. But if you can find the right funding for it, I think internships are definitely the way to go to at least make uh, these STEM fields more accessible because it's, it's, it's about like giving them the educational tools they need but also the, the uh, confidence to, to try out for other jobs in those fields, right? They can say to themselves, I did this at this museum, I think I can work in this area and then actually apply to them because I don't think that part happens as much. And I will say like a great, a great example of that happening. Mm -hmm. um, so one program that I'm involved with is called SciVis. It's Space Camp for Interested Visually Im Impaired Students. Um, and every year for a week we take a group of kids, a large group of kids from all over the world who are visually impaired. And it's just these kids who are visually impaired down at Space Camp. Um, mm -hmm. And everything is made accessible to them. Everything is brailled. There's large print editions. We have readers. We have magnifiers. Um, and we just have a whole group of people there who like tactiles, we know how to work, work with them. Um, and if we don't, they tell us. And um, these kids, just you see them grow so much. And there's actually a woman who, she didn't think that was for her. She went to this program that's always evolving, always changing, we're always getting feedback and making it better. Um, and she actually wound up, she works in payloads operation mission control for NASA now. Um, I had another student who was with me, and he's studying astronomy in college, and he's totally blind. So if there's a will, there's a way. Sometimes they just need something to show them that it is attainable. Mm -hmm. So like I said, working, working with them, and this, I mean, SciVis has been going for over 25 years now. It, it started small and has grown into this massive program. So that first step of just reaching out 
that's huge. Yeah, definitely. Is there any more questions from the audience? Oh, over there. Yeah. Out you go. Oh, uh, Go ahead. Guy with the mic first. All right, I've got the mic. Great. Um, <laughs> uh, I wanted to get back to diversity. Um, I mean, looking around the room, it's there are a bunch of white people in this room. Uh, how do we, as as people of privilege, uh, approach these communities? And I, I'd like to hear more specific examples. It sounds like all of you are doing amazing things with um, with accessibility, um, but diversity is a really big thing. And uh, I'd especially like to hear how. Uh, what strategies you, ha strategies you all have to convince um, your management, who are, let's face it, usually old white males, to get out of these communities and that they're important, but also that they'll bring revenue and bring attendance, because that's, you know, the bottom line is a big thing, especially, especially for people who, you know, write the checks. So. Yeah, well, so my CEO is actually an African-American woman, but um, so uh, because we are in such a diverse place in Detroit, we have a, a fairly diverse staff, or we're, we, we try to keep a diverse staff, um, though though sometimes it is hard to, you know, find qualified staff members that are also, you know, a, a diverse audience. Uh, we, we, we even struggle with that in the area that, that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think just uh, hopefully reaching out to our community um, because, I mean, diversity is much more of a, an issue and a topic now than it, I think, ever used to be. Um, and starting now, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, sort of change the, the perspective that to be a planetarian, you have to be an old white dude, like, <laughs> um, which was the perspective not too long ago. So I think mm -hmm. as, as we, as we sort of work uh, now in the community is hopefully in 10 years, it'll look a little, a little different. Mm -hmm. um, we've been in the news. I'm not gonna beat around the bush. I mean, you all know what's been going on here. Um, and it's been amazing to see the community start to come together. Um, a lot of the peaceful protests that have been going on here, you see white people who recognize that yeah, this is an issue that needs to change. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not gonna say that, yay, everything's all better, because we have a long way to go. We really, really do. Um, but I love that my community's starting to recognize that and pull together on that. Um, it's unfortunate that it's taken so long, but I think we're making some great steps in that. And I know that the Science Center, the St. Louis Science Center, wants to be seen as a safe place for everybody to come and just geek out. That's actually one of our values is we want to be that safe place for everybody to come and let your inner geek out. Nobody should be afraid to do that. Um, our um, chief officer of science education and experience is an African American as well. Um, you may have seen him at karaoke last night whipping out some Peebo Bryson. Um, it was pretty awesome. Uh, but uh, we also have a program called Youth Exploring Science or the Yes Teens. Um, and it's actually funded by a grant from the US Navy um, and it reaches out to at-risk teens. Um, and so a good chunk of the majority of that program um, is a large population of our African-American community. And it's run by um, several very talented women uh, who are also of African-American descent. And what's really cool is we have a lot of kids who come out of that program and they go on to, like I think a couple of them are like CEOs now. Um, but as they progress within the Yes Teen program, they start becoming ambassadors and they start mentoring those younger kids. So now you're seeing these kids who are succeeding and they're becoming the role models for the new kids coming in. And then those kids start succeeding and they're becoming the role models for And it's, it's a positive feedback cycle. So getting programs like that in there and then empowering those kids who are a year or two in to empower the next kids who come in, that's awesome. That does more than I, as an extremely European blonde woman, could ever do. And just having that available and opening up that up to, to the people who can be those role models and recognizing that you're not gonna be a role model to everyone. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and having, having a support 
a, a support network. So with the STEM and ISTA project, we have a, a database of role models. There's over 250 role models on that database, all female uh, scientists, engineers, mathematicians, all of that stuff. So there's a database where people can go and see you know, who else is doing what? What can I do? H how can I see myself in that role? And the, the role models are not just in the Detroit area, the, though they are. The, the CEO of GM is in our database. Um, but the, we, we have them from around the, the United States, and we have role models from around the world, even. We have some role models from Africa that heard about the program and were like, we want to sign up to be role models. They don't, I, I mean, they're just in the database. Um, we, we do have the, the local Detroit ones, that they, they're actually the ones that work with the kids, um, but just to have a, a, a support network, because um, you can also reach out to these people and, and ask questions and all of that stuff, um, to have that support network to move forward. Well, at, at our planetarium, um, there's a, another population we've been able to serve. There's the sort of, you know, the racial minorities, I think, but then we've got sort of the historically subjugated minorities as well. And so a couple years ago, we had the LGBTQ group on our campus looking for a place to meet. And they decided that the planetarium would be an awesome place to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we worked with them uh, and, and went through ally training and learned how best to work with, with students who, because we're a two-year college, we have a lot of students who may not necessarily have the financial background or the family background to go to the four-year university and live on campus and have that experience, who may not have yet come out, and they, or if they did to their parents, there was a you know, less than optimal reaction to that, and, and the planetarium became a safe place, like some place that they could go on campus if they felt that there was, you know, if, if they felt uneasy or unsafe, that this was a place that they could go and do that, and in, in a lot of ways, it was like yet another gateway for us to be able to help students, especially uh, female students or transgendered students who felt, I'm never going to be able to fit into a STEM field that is so rigid and hierarchical and overwhelmingly male that it doesn't matter. We can give, I don't know, just a step in the right direction. And, and we've seen it's small numbers. It's not, you know, again, it's, it's not a huge part of, of what we do, but it's, you know, these you know, few people a semester that we're able to help guide and mentor and almost kind of like protect. Um, they've got a place that they know that they can go that, that, that they will be safe. Yeah, safe place and, a, and, and having that, that network there. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yes, uh, I'm um, Mel Blake from Alabama, and um, that tells you all you need to know about why I'm asking this question. Um, how do you deal with the political blowback? Because I very often say, hey, we need to go and do more of this. We need to have more women in science. We need, And people will be like, well, how come you think men can't do science? Or uh, you know, you're want to do a program for the girls at this school. What are the boys going to do? How come you don't want the boys to do your program? And so it's a variation on we really don't want to change, right? But how do you, I mean, I, I don't know how conservative this area is, but Alabama's conservative, conservative, you know, Roy yeah. Moore territory. So how, how do you fight that battle? Any advice you can give me about what the counter argument is? Um, um, so, so yes, uh, definitely. Um, so the, the Detroit area, Detroit itself, very diverse, uh, like awesome community. I love living in Detroit. Uh, the suburbs? Not as much. Uh, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you know about the 67 riots. We, we just sort of memorialized the 67 riots uh, a couple months ago uh, in the Detroit area. And um, there was a lot of, they call it white flight. So everybody that, that was not African American basically left the city. And we still have a lot of pushback from, like, from the suburbs. Um, with uh, trying to incorporate diversity into everything that we do. Um, because of that, we, we actually run a, a huge astronomy event every year, but we do it out in the suburbs. And I, it's, uh, we, we partner with the, the astronomical clubs in the area, 
and we, we do it out in the suburbs, and I asked them, why do we do this in the suburbs? Why wouldn't we do this back where there are people? Um, why wouldn't we do this in a community where you know, these kids have never looked through a telescope in their entire lives? And the answer was, well, we don't want to go into Detroit because there's that stigma. They go into the city and they're going to get shot. I don't know why that stigma is there because it's not. I mean, there's, there's, it, it, it's a, it, I mean, I the same, same, yeah. it's the same yeah. thing in St. Louis, yeah. Um, it, but we, we're really trying to just push back against that. And we, we basically just took a stand and said, you don't like it, tough. Um, and I know that's really hard to do. And I think there was a, a panel about controversy in the dome when yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah so uh, and and we, we kind of have taken that stand this is this is what we're doing this is the programming that we're doing and and with the we, we do female specific programming for three eighth grade girls but we don't exclude anybody we target we say this is the Steminista project this is for fourth through eighth grade girls but if a, a fourth through eighth grade boy comes to us and says, I want to join the Steminista Project, I want to, I want to do uh, the, the same workshop that they're doing, we say, OK, cool, come on in. Um, because we, we, we don't exclude anybody. We just target. Um, and that's, that's an argument that you can use is we're really not excluding anybody. We're just trying to target an audience that we may not necessarily reach. Um, and. And I would add that we need to be supporting each other as the planetarium community. So mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're struggling to find the resources you need to make that stand or to show your administration that this is something that's really important and needs to happen, reach out to us. Reach out to us on Dome Dialogues. Reach out to us on Dome L. Email us. Reflect. Find us. Stock us down. Come, come to our planetariums and find us. But... but talk to us, maybe we have a program that's succeeding and we can give you the data, because everybody loves mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. And if we can give you data that shows it's working, maybe that can help make a stand. Well, my, my department chair is a woman and my dean is a woman who's holding a STEM, women in STEM workshop this month. So they're very supportive. Yeah. But the people that you have to ask the money to in the state government, mm -hmm. Yeah. Are, are less less supportive yeah well and and again just to to, to take them the data um, and and we have the data a, a lot of institutions are, are doing that I think Renee you're working on a program for females in science yes well, I teach a sciences for girls okay so uh, I mean they're planetarians all over the place are, are doing stuff like that and to be able to take them the data and show why this is important um, and why they should be funding it. And, and if, if, well, if you work at a university, they're probably not as worried about the revenue. <laughs> but uh, it, I know for, for those of us at a science center, if it's not making money, we really can't, well, if it's not making money or bringing us donors, we can't do it. Um, but but they're, definitely reach out to those in the community with, with the data and the hard evidence, then we'll, we'll definitely help out, yeah. So along that, uh, I was just wondering, like, do you know of any of the data that shows that uh, having programs like this just increases the diversity and increases the number of people that are doing this, and it doesn't decrease like the boys? You know, it doesn't decrease the amount of boys that are involved in this stuff. It just, right. I, you know, so the. I, I will say this is still a fairly new area and a new topic, so this this needs long-term study. Mm -hmm. We are we are still kind of figuring out what you know tar does targeting girls really give you know a step a leg up and all of that stuff. Um, but I don't think it decreases boys. Yeah, I think that would help as well, um, and and just that there that there is research out there and that's something that we're working on and maybe even in tying that into your programming saying like I want to be part of this research group um, they might be uh, more willing to, to fund as well mm -hmm. and as as a former classroom teacher I hate standardized testing I hate teaching to the test however 
the national standardized tests regarding science, those numbers can help you too because as the kids get older, you start to see that gap between the boys and the girls grow and grow and grow. Um, and then they also break it down um, ethnic group wise as well. Yeah. And those numbers are depressing. Yeah. And those gaps grow, like I said, quite a bit. Um, and so even those numbers alone are gonna show that the boys are, the boys are staying where they're staying. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. the gap that grows with the girls. The girls decrease in their knowledge. Well, and actually girls outperform boys until about fifth or sixth grade. Yep. And then. That, that, those middle school years are critical. Yes, definitely. All right, well, I think that's all we actually, have. Actually, Paula, can I, can I make oh, one yeah, more yeah, comment yeah, about yeah, this? Definitely. Since we've had already like three or four questions about how to pitch to an administrator, I wanted to point out one more angle that I think is worth considering. I mean, it's, uh, diversity is the right thing to do. That should always be the number one. But if you're having trouble with an administrator, monetize it. There's always, there's always funding for people who are doing these diverse programs, right? People fund programs because they're diverse. Mm -hmm. So that really is an angle. Yeah, that we and, can and maybe not necessarily going to state funding, um, but national, the national funding is definitely yeah. mm -hmm. there for, for programs like that. NSF and NASA, definitely. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Definitely NASA. All right, so I think that's all that we have time for. If you guys have any questions, uh, find us throughout the conference, and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll definitely talk, and it'll, it'll be great. Yay! Mm -hmm. All right, thank you guys so much. Thank you all.